Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Converge. Welcome if you're joining us online as well. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, we got a couple announcements this morning. We're going to start off with announcing that there's no Sunday school um, through the month of July. So if you have little ones, there's no Sunday school. There is a nursery for those that are really little, um, but uh, for the Sunday school age kids, there is no Sunday school. Gives our teachers a little bit of a break to recoup, plan for next year, and get things ready. Um, yeah, the flag distribution. That was a great turnout. There's a bunch of people prepping the flags right there, putting the little uh, Sunshine Preschool as well as the pancake cards on the flags there. Um, my group did about 73 flags. There are some that probably did more than 100 in the neighborhood. So that was, that was a great turnout. We're glad to do it for the neighborhood. And uh, as Pastor Mike said, yeah, it's, uh, we got a few thank yous as well as when we were out there. Um, and I it's probably because my kids were with me, you know, and looking adorable carrying a little flag running around the neighborhood. Um, our next announcement here is uh, Family Fun Night. That's coming up at the end of the week. That's July 7th. That's our next one. So if you, if you don't have enough uh, things going on this week already, uh, we, we would love to see you. Um, it starts at 6 I think, um, on, on Friday there. So if, if you want to come out, play a few games, uh, socialize with everyone that comes out, eat a hot dog or two, um, there's always watermelon. There's always watermelon. So, um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing you there as well. Um, then we have uh, Help Wanted. If you have a particular set of skills... We are looking for you. We have, we have skills that are needed back here in the sound booth, as well as with the kids in the nursery. There's lots of opportunities to help out in the church. Um, all you have to do is contact Pastor Mike, and he'll hook you up with the right spot. Hey, you might have to tell him what your skills are, though, all right? Um, next, we have uh, uh, pancakes in the parking lot. That is Tuesday. I am looking forward to it. Uh, I usually make pancakes on Saturday, so this is going to throw my routine off a little bit. But, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. There's, there's always great fun happening there. Um, lots of people helping out already. We got the sign-up sheet that went out, and um, we got lots of names on there already. So thank you for that. Um, and that kicks off, I think, at 9 Yep, so 9 o'clock. Uh, if you're helping set up, I think 8.30 is the time to set up. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys. And uh, then later in the afternoon, we have the, the 4th of July celebration that the church puts on. Bring fireworks. There's lots of little games. There's watermelon eating contests. Maybe dress up as Uncle Sam if you can, you know, if you have that ability. Um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. It's always a good time. So come on out and celebrate with us. Uh, then we have... Uh, Deb and sorry, Deb and Larry Harold have an announcement for us. So I'm going to listen to what they have for us. Hello to all our church friends, and thank you so much for the prayer and support for both Deb and me. Yes, it's been a rough couple months, mm -hmm. and uh, it hasn't mm -hmm. gone the way we wanted it to go. No. But through it all, we love and trust our God. As a good dear friend told us, and it's kind of become our mantra, life is hard, God is good, blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He starts chemo on July 13th, so we are praying that he'll stay infection free till then and through then, so he can get the chemo in his system. So thanks again, and goodbye. We miss you. See them, huh? Uh, yeah, it has been a hard road for uh, Deb and Larry. Uh, you know, it's a pretty dire situation when you're trying to get healthy enough to start chemo. Um, but their spirits are, are up, and they are working through those challenges they come, and they're uh, a great testimony for the Lord through the trial that they're experiencing. They're consistently expressing their joy and their faith in Him. Hey, does anybody, uh, anybody remember on the sign-up sheet, I think Tyler meant, said like 8.30 for if you're help setting up, but it's earlier than that for this one. And does anybody remember, it's pretty early for setup team. 7.30, yeah. Uh, we got to set up some extra things. Thank you, Phil. Um, so if you're on that signed up, I just didn't wanted to make sure that we didn't get signals crossed. Um, 
we are looking at 7.30 for the setup team um, for that day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the, the ability to, uh, even, if we, if we, even if we can't see Deb and uh, Larry here regularly, I know that uh, the immune system being down means that they can't mingle with people as much as that they, that they would like to, um, but uh, what a privilege to be able to get a little bit of a taste of where they're at through a video like this. And, and we pray that even today, I pray that they wouldn't feel isolated and alone on an island with this, with this suffering. I pray that they would know that even as we um, watch, that our hearts go out to them and that their good friends have not forgotten them, but continue to pray. And we do pray. We ask that you would give um, Larry strength. We pray that he would be infection-free and uh, that his health would improve to the degree that they could continue the treatment that they have uh, chosen. Heavenly Father, our hearts also go out to Sharon Reed. We pray that your, uh, your spirit would be with her to give her peace. She is uh, looking forward, even with joy, uh, to homecoming. And uh, so we pray that in these days you would be her constant companion and that she would have a peace that passes all understanding. Heavenly Father, our prayers uh, go out even beyond the local community here in the church. Uh, we do pray for the activities that are taking place uh, on, uh, well, this whole week, but especially with the pancake breakfast as we play host to the neighborhood. We pray that a good number would come in again. Uh, you've always blessed us that way. Help us to serve them well. Help us to, to see and anticipate needs. Help us to bring a smile. Um, just the, the statistics tell us that people are hurting, people are depressed, people are grieving all around us. And, and help us to be a bright light, um, not to demonstrate our own strength and resilience, but to reflect Jesus Christ to the people who come. Our dear Heavenly Father, um, we also pray beyond this area. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of France this morning. France is on my heart. Um, as the riots have continued there for days, um, those who have sworn themselves to uphold the law are in, in danger's way. Uh, people who are, uh, have no interest whatsoever in the violence are being caught up in things that they don't want to be a part of. And uh, Heavenly Father, there is trouble in that country. And I pray again that your spirit of peace would descend on that place, that people uh, who have evil intentions would be, uh, their, their plans and their plots would be thwarted, uh, would be frustrated on every hand. And I pray that peace would descend. I pray especially that uh, Christian witness and churches that are still holding on to the gospel would have a message of hope for people who are hurting and suffering in that land. Bring peace, peace we pray. And of course, for Ananya, for uh, that church that we have grown to love, um, we pray for peace there. We pray for an absence of fear, that there would be courage. And even as they meet for church today, may their hearts be filled with hope. Um, and would they remember that the, the, the arm of the Lord is strong, even for them in their current situation. Now, Heavenly Father, as we look again into your word, Heavenly Father, we want um, your spirit to be our guide into the truth. We're so prone uh, to wander off. We're, we're so prone to read our own thoughts and, and believe that they are yours. But, Heavenly Father, we want to be attentive to your voice this morning more than any other. So we ask that your spirit would guide us into the truth as we study this passage in Exodus 3. In Jesus' name, amen. Very well, let's begin again uh, studying the life of Moses. We come, as I mentioned, to Exodus chapter 3. I couldn't help but think as far as the national, well, international news this last week. This last week was the week that we heard about this uh, potential coup, right, 
or I don't know if it can be called a coup, but this, this mercenary group, Wagner group, turning around and, and uh, marching towards their employers, <laughs> marching towards Moscow. And uh, when that story got out a little bit, they had already turned back around, and, and now the leader is in uh, Belarus, in exile there. And I couldn't help but think of Moses. Right? Uh, we saw Moses' failed attempt to, to start an insurrection in Egypt, and we saw him turn tail as well, ending up in Midian at the well, as we saw the end of that story last week. So we're going to pick it up there. Before we get into that, though, I want to kind of introduce you in the direction I want to take our thoughts. And uh, an image came to my mind that's part of my experience, and you might relate to it too as you think back. Maybe it came from the standpoint of being a parent, maybe from the standpoint of being a child who was drawn into this experience. We have a picture up there, Tim, um, of a cluttered garage. Now, you're, I'm, no, I know, you, this is not your garage. Your garages are all neat. But it seems like my garages uh, from my childhood on always tend to get cluttered. I mean, immediately. You could clean it up and immediately it got cluttered again. So I want you to imagine with me today, or, or like I said, maybe it's not even too far from your imagination. Maybe it was real. Maybe you can remember your dad saying, it's Saturday, we're going to clean out the garage. And maybe you had another agenda. Oh, maybe you're the parent. Maybe you're the one that told the child, uh, we're going to clean out the garage. And, and here's the way I kind of remember it. I always had other things going that did not include cleaning out a garage. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to work this in? And, and being the eager beaver that I was, I would do something like, oh, I'll get ahead of it. So I don't miss the ball game. I don't miss playing army in the ditch or whatever. We actually played outside when I was a kid. Um, but anyway, what, to get on with what I'm going to do, I'm going to get ahead of this. So grab the keys back the car out of the garage, and sweep where the car was. Sweep where the car was. I cleaned the garage, right? And you know where this is going. And then, and then the parent comes out and says, <laughs> no, 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 we're cleaning the garage. Why don't you back that car out into the street? Because all of this stuff is coming out into the driveway. And as a kid, your hopes just sink. It's like, oh, impossible. I'm suddenly weak. This is never good. Oh, yeah, we're taking the stuff down off the shelves. See all that dirt and grime? We got we to gotta get that out of here. We're going to set things. Oh, my word. The weekend is gone, right? I can't possibly do this. And, and I feel like that's kind of where Moses was. I feel like Moses had one idea about what God had called him to do because we know that he had a sense that God was going to use him to deliver the people, right? And so he attempted that when he was 40. As the prince of Egypt, he tried that. It was a big job, but he thought if I just get started, maybe God has put me in a position where it can get done. But God had a way bigger vision for Moses than simply allowing the people to get to freedom. He wasn't just sweeping the garage, he was cleaning the place out. And that was something that Moses couldn't possibly do. In fact, he couldn't even get the sweeping done right. Huh? And yet God called him to a job that was even bigger than what he had failed at. I think that's important. There's a small but important distinction between serving God and serving His agenda. And too often, I think we depersonalize it because we're so used to a Christian culture and we're so used to the responsibilities that we feel come along with Doing church, so you see, help wanted, right? We got this sign up there. We go, oh, yeah, hmm. A lot of, a lot of hands-on is required to, to make this thing work, and I feel responsible, and so I'm getting involved, and I want to be part of that agenda, and I want to pitch in. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that our service is personal 
we're not just getting work done, we're serving the living God. And serving the living God often will take us outside of our comfort zone into a new land called beyond our abilities and then way beyond our imagination, way out there. And so the question enters the mind, we think, well, shoot, I'm not even very good when I just try to do my responsibility. How in the world do I do a God-sized job when I feel like a failure at man-sized work? Right? Here's the lesson for us today from Exodus chapter 3. Even turning the page and finding the story continues is a blessing, right? So last week we saw that Moses had failed in his attempt to deliver the children of Israel. He ends up in Midian at a well. He delivers the daughters of Jethro there. And we think, well, nice try. Here, have a quiet life of ranching sheep. We turn the page, and it continues. Even that little turn of the page and finding the story continues is a good reminder to each one of us that the story continues even after a, pursue, a perceived failure in our lives. God is always willing to turn the page and continue. God never gives up on any one of us. So, as a prince of Egypt, Moses attempted to deliver Israel. And at 40 years old, when he was at that point, he failed and he fled. For the next 40 years, he was a shepherd of the sheep. And the Bible, through all of this experience, is very, very quiet. We simply know that that's what he did. He was a part of the, the extended patriarchal family of Jethro. And he had married into that family. And he was a shepherd of sheep in Midian. Now he's 80 years old. Can you imagine? I mean, he had a career as a prince, and he had a full career as a shepherd when we come to this pivotal story in Exodus chapter 3. Let's remember that the backstory is significant for explaining the man. The backstory is always significant, and I'm hopefully, I hope you feel drawn into that. Your backstory, your encounters with God, your triumphs and your failures are all important for explaining who you are at this moment. And I hope that you're aware of them and you see them through the interpretive lens that is God and His Word. So we're getting the backstory, And we come to Exodus chapter 3, this pivotal, pivotal moment, and we read this. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness um, think pasture there. Too often we insert desert. This would be new pasture lands uh, on the steppe. Came to the steppe or the, the, the plateau at, the, at, at Horeb, the mountain of God, another name for Sinai. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, whenever you hear your name, you, you instinctively know this, right? If you hear your name twice, perk up your ears, right? Uh, Jesus said, Martha, Martha. Jesus said, Peter, Peter. There's sitting a number of times in Scripture, and every one of them, when, when you hear Joe, Joe, <laughs> and it's the Lord, when it's twice, listen up. So God says, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This, this is an important place to start as we consider this segment of Moses' narrative. And it tells me that service to God, because that's indeed what is happening here. He's going to be commissioned into God's plan. 
Service to God begins in His presence. Uh, it's that whole idea I was getting at. Sometimes we get un, uh, unfortunately drawn into the idea of serving God's agenda and forget that we're serving His person, right? Service to God begins in His presence. Now, just remember with me, it's, sometimes we know all the stories, but it's hard to keep them straight. The burning bush experience was Moses' first personal encounter with the God of the patriarchs. He's 80 years old. You know him as the deliverer of Israel. You know him as the lawgiver. You associate him with personal connections with God. He's the one who met God in a tent. He's the one who met God on a mountain. And yet what we're seeing here is the very first. He's never met with God before. There are stories that told him God spoke to Abraham. There's stories that God spoke to Jacob, all the patriarchs. He's never met God before. It's all been just a part of his heritage. And so this is the very first personal encounter with the God of the patriarchs. And what he learns right off the bat here is that God is the God who knows his name. It wasn't, hey you, right, out of the burning bush. Hey you, now that I got your attention, come over here. Who are you? What you doing? It's Moses. Moses. In a personal encounter with God, you discover in a very deep, satisfying way that God knows you personally. God knows you one-to-one. -one. Not just the way you sign your letters, He knows everything that fills in what goes behind the name. Moses. Moses. Secondly, note that God reveals himself to you. I am, he says. I'm the God of your father. You know, you know. He's coaxing it out of Moses. Moses is making an enormous number of connections right here, right? He's having a supernatural experience that he's never had before, but it's getting connected with all the stories of the heritage. And now he knows. So God reveals himself to you. And then thirdly, God places demands on you. That's the way it works. Now, if, if it's any sort of other just simply numinous or mystical or spiritual experience, and that's why our, our culture loves spiritual experiences, not a great big fan of God, is because if God truly is personal in the divinity, then there comes demands along with the revelation. And sure enough, we see here that the God who knows your name, the God who is willing to reveal himself to you, is also the God who will put demands on your life, since he is the creator and he is the holy God. Now, can we just settle on this phrase a little bit? He says here, I will turn aside, I'm Moses, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. I want, to, I want to lead your meditation on just that sentence for a little bit. It's obvious what's going on. He has seen a phenomenon in the wilderness that he's never seen before. I imagine he's seen a bush burn up. But this one's unique in that it's fully and totally engulfed in flames, but it just keeps burning and it's not consumed. And so there is something that has caught his attention and it is a wonder, right? It's a marvel. It's something out of the ordinary. It's something extraordinary. And it causes him to turn. Moses says, huh, God tells the poor about that. I'm going to go home. No, he turns aside to investigate more closely what exactly is going on in this situation. And I think there's something really wonderful going on here. As I mentioned, numinous, I use that word. Numinous is a term derived from the Latin numen, meaning arousing spiritual or religious feeling. It's something that is mysterious or awe-inspiring. 
We need to be in touch with things that happen in our lives that are numinous. Let's not shy away from that. Now, I, rightfully so, I, we are people who hold up and elevate the use of the mind, right? Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I hold to that. I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, good, solid thinking, but let's not downplay experiences that cause in us wonder or a sense of awe because God often uses them not just in the Bible but in the present day if we're tuned in to get our attention. To get our attention, so let's be aware. In, in uh, the book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, uh, C.S. Lewis demonstrates that he understands that we need to fully experience joy and enjoy the pleasures that God has given us in order to be drawn into His presence. In other words, the good things in life aren't ends in themselves. They draw us towards God. Listen to what he says. He says, I've tried to make every pleasure into a channel of adoration. There's a spiritual discipline you could try. Every pleasure into a channel of adoration. I don't mean simply by giving thanks for it. One must, of course, give thanks. I mean something different. How shall I put it? We can't, or I can't, hear the song of a bird simply as a sound. Its meaning or message comes with it inevitably. Just as one can't see a familiar word in print as a merely visual pattern, the reading is as involuntary as the seeing. I'm sorry, I'm skipping down a little bit here. He says, the sweet air whispers of the country from whence it blows. It is a message. We know we are being touched by a finger of that right hand at which there are pleasures forevermore. Did you enjoy the rain yesterday? Was it nigh on to numinous? Did it speak to you not only of wetness falling from the sky, but of a hand that gives rain, you know what C.S. Lewis was talking about. There need be no question of thanks or praise as a separate event, something done afterwards, to experience the tiny theophany is itself to adore. Listen, gratitude exclaims very properly, how good of God to give me this. Adoration says, what must be the quality of that being whose far-off and momentary coruscations. How many times have you used that word in the last week? Coruscations are like this. One's mind runs back up the sunbeam to the sun. Is that beautiful? One's mind runs back up the sunbeam to the sun. A coruscation is a sudden display of brilliance, a flash of light, a brilliance. And what C.S. Lewis is saying, we experience things all the time, everywhere, which if we would follow them would lead us to the presence of God. Every pleasure is a gift of God. Every pleasure is an invitation into the person of who he was, who he is. And notice that Moses, when he saw this burning bush, which was a wonder, which was a coruscation, say it with me, coruscation. Yeah, that wasn't very good, but anyway. Um, <laughs> what he did was he turned aside, right? He turned aside to see what was up with this. And all I'm doing is I'm encouraging you, since service begins in God's presence, I'm going to say, well, you're asking me, how do I get into God's presence? Follow the sunbeam to the sun. Connect your experiences of delight and pleasure with the God who gives every good and perfect gift. Follow it. He's got burning bushes all over in your life. Follow them, turn aside, take time to meditate, and follow them into God's presence. 
running back up the sunbeam to the sun will be your burning bush. It will be your holy ground. It's no mistake that Moses' encounter with God comes before his commission. The encounter with God, this worship comes before his commission, right? It's critical. Let's imagine it the other way. Let's imagine this whole story a little bit differently if we could. Imagine it's Moses' 80th birthday, right? Uh, they have to keep waking him up to blow out the candles, right? He's nodding off at the table there a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, he's not really into the party. He's a little moody and reflective. It's 80 years for heaven's sakes. And so he steals away from everyone who's dancing around the fire singing la 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 la. He's a little tired of that by now. And he steals away to a quiet place by the side of a tent. He takes his, he, he takes his journal with him. And as he flips through and he reviews his life, what sticks in his mind? A signal failure 40 years ago. I, well, I had one big flash and it was a failure. And after that, it was pretty much just dragging sheep around the desert. This is my life. And then, as repulsive as, and impossible as it sounds, he thinks... Well, I suppose I'll never feel fulfilled if I don't go back and try again. Can you imagine if the whole idea of going back to Egypt would have been out of a burden of personal responsibility? Shoot. I've been avoiding this for 40 years. I was a disaster as a prince of Egypt. I don't know what a shepherd does, but I might as well die trying. Here we go. I'm going to crawl back across the desert and... No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. You don't rise up out of a sense of simple responsibility and obligation and go back and do what was the seminal failure of your life. The commissioning of Moses comes out of communion with God. It transforms the whole idea. And your service must too. Not out of obligation, but a sense that God is going with you. That God is going to go with you into whatever he calls you. Now, we know it's coming. Let's not poke fun at Moses' excuses, right? This is great fodder for youth pastors. I want to get up and talk about how Moses made excuses not to say yes to God. But let's not poke fun at him. Instead, let's try to learn something again. Let's follow that sunbeam. What does it tell us about God? Uh, one commentator said this, It would seem that we can never lose but only gain immeasurably by being honest with God. I love that phrase. It would seem from the example in front of us that we can never lose but only gain immeasurably by being honest with God. Try it. Try it. Uh, if you think that you have been able to or at least was important that you try to communicate only devotion and glory to God about your present situation, try being honest and see where it takes you. So we read in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you. I've come down to deliver. Come, I'll send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, here's the first of five dodges, all right? But Moses said to God, who I am that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, but, but I will be with you. 
That conversation should have ended right there, right? Well, hopefully it will for us. It doesn't. Continues to be instructive. He said, but I will be with you. And this will be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you bring the people, have brought the people out of Egypt, you all together, that's a plural there, you all together will serve God on this mountain where we're standing right now. You're going to come back to this mountain with all of Israel around you and you're going to remember this day, Moses. And it will be a lasting testimony. Moses offers five dodges. Um, I'm not sure if we can be absolutely positive about the tone, but the last of these dodges seems to indicate that we know where he was going all along because on the very last one, he says, send someone else, right? So he's got all of these different things, but having had those answered, the very last thing he brings up with God is simply, no, can you find someone else? So I tend to think that that's where he's going all along. Um, But we're always looking for the Ooh, that's interesting about Moses. Get a glimpse of his personality. Notice that Moses was afraid. He took off his shoes. He's on holy ground. He's scared in the situation. It says he hid his face for fear that he would see God. He's in worshiping awe, and yet he talks back in a very brash manner to God. Interesting guy, this Moses. I don't know. Where does it come from? He's not irreverent. But he doesn't just rise up and go, he, well, let's clarify some things, God, right? Interesting. What we're learning here is that God's presence is your qualification and empowerment to serve. It's your qualification and empowerment to serve. You've met God. He's commissioned you to be his servant It is his presence that qualifies you and will indeed enable you to do whatever he calls you to. So we're not going to go through all five of these dodges in detail. Let me just list them. The first one here is, who am I? What he's saying basically is that there, I have no clout. I couldn't do it as a prince. Shepherds don't get this kind of work done. Who am I? This This is not a deep psychological, oh, who am I? You know, that's, that's us reading into the passage. He's simply saying, do I have any clout? I don't, I've got no stock to do this. Who am I? I'm a peon. God answers, I'll be with you. That's the difference. But I will be with you. Secondly, Moses says, what shall I tell them uh, if they ask what is his name? Interesting, as I thought about this, I'm not even sure absolutely 100% who them is. I'm guessing it's probably the leaders of the children of Israel could have been Egyptians, Um, but I think probably Israel. What he's saying here is, I've got no inside track with God. I've got no special relationship with God that I can claim to this point. And then God answers, and this is the passage in which he says, uh, we derive the name Yahweh. Um, He says in verse 12, I will be what I will be. Uh, Most of your translations say, I am that I am. Um, The verb is actually imperfect in Hebrew, and so a better, really literal translation is, I will be what I will be. And I think what God is getting at when he gives that revelation, he says, if you need power, I will be power. If you need persuasion, I will be persuasion. If you need provision, I will be provision. It's a name that is to give comfort to Moses to say, I will be exactly what you need in the moment that you need it. I am everything that you need. I will be for you. So later on, that's verse 12, verse 15 then, in the grammar, it actually says the Lord in caps in your Bible, which is Yahweh. So there's where the name comes in, and we're not sure. The name is Yahweh, is related, of course, to Hebrew ech, yeah, the, the, the imperfect, I will be, and it's more like I am. Uh, boy, commentators have filled volumes trying to make the the association connection, but from that time on, the Hebrews know the Lord as Yahweh. 
Third objection, they will not believe me. I have no credibility, and God gives Moses three signs. A staff that becomes a serpent, his hand that becomes leprous inside his cloak, and then the third one, water will become blood. The fourth one, Moses says, I am not eloquent. I can't do this. I'm not eloquent. I have no natural abilities or skills with which to get this job done. Which is interesting because in Acts, Stephen says he was mighty in word and deed. Again, I'm not sure what that means. Is this just self-deprecation? Moses is saying, yeah, I don't believe in myself. Had something happened in this whole exchange with Pharaoh and 40 years in the wilderness that he's saying, you know what? Not quite as quick as I used to be. I don't know. Stephen says when he was a prince, he was mighty in word and deed. When you get to 80, Moses himself says, uh, look for somebody else. I'm not that great. Okay? Interesting. And then the last one, please send someone else. Moses communicates, I really don't have any desire to be the deliverer. I'm a shepherd now. I got a life. I got a family. I got sheep. I know my way around this job right here. And God says, tell you what, I'm going to give you Aaron. You got to do this with your brother. I did that with my family sometimes when kids didn't want to do things. You think this is an odious chore to do yourself? Now do it with your brother. Oof, that's just rough. That is rough. Anyway, God answers all of his questions, all of his dodges. God persistently deals with Moses' fears with this assurance, I will go with you. A little bit of an illustration. Um, child is afraid at night, there's monsters under the bed, you're going to have trouble as a parent trying to convince the kid there's no monsters under the bed, right? Because as soon as you sweep around under there, you demonstrate that those no monsters, and you walk out the door, well, how about if there's monsters now? Now that you left, right? You, monster eggs hatch, they're really quick. And so you never know. The only solution is if dad or mom will say, tell you what, I'm going to stand guard no monsters get into you that doesn't come through me. I will be with you. My presence is there. Here's what God says. I'm going to call you to something that you failed before in a small version of. I want you to do something impossibly great and bigger, but I'll be with you. I don't want you to sweep the garage. I want you to clean the garage, but this time I'll help you. This time my presence will be with you. Many people try on a little bit of religion with the high aspiration of staying out of trouble. Uh, I like to go to church, kind of keeps me out of trouble. Live a decent life. God wants so much more for you. Listen, a man wants to hold down a job. God says, well, that's tough. But I'm calling you to represent Jesus Christ at your work in everything that you do. A gal wants to manage a productive schedule. God says, I want you to redeem the time because the days are evil. I got something way bigger than simply managing time. The couple wants to raise kids. God says, hey, raise kids, fine. I'm calling you to teach your children diligently to pass on God's word when you sit, when you stand, when you rise up, when you go along the way. <laughs> I got a way bigger job than simply the one that's easy to fail at, which is raising. I got something way bigger. She hopes to keep contact with friends. God calls her to encourage and to mentor. They're committed to attend church. God wants them to worship in spirit and truth, week in and week out. He finally agrees to teach Sunday school. God calls him to shepherd God's little flock of preschoolers. She takes her turn in the nursery. God calls her to patient, nurturous, nurturing, and selfless love modeled after the, the example of Jesus Christ. You see where we see things, and we sometimes have successes, and we sometimes have failure, and, some, and, and all the time they're shooting lower than God intends. He wants to give you a mission that is incomparably greater than something that you can simply slap a label on and say, I'm doing this job, I'm, I'm filling this role, I'm filling the slot. He's called you to mission impossible. The difference is, he says, I'm going to go with you. 
um, I'll be with you. To sum it up, we fail to live up to our own convictions, and God calls us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And you say, who am I? I can't even live up to my own standards. Who am I? And he says, yes, but with your spirit, my spirit within you, as you abide in my son, Jesus Christ, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. God's calling you to something that's huge. And I'm not talking about the help wanted sign on the screen. I'm talking about God calling you to a life of holiness. A, a life of love for your neighbors. Our world's just talking about tolerance every single day. Forget, I almost said something stronger, tolerance. Love. Jesus says love. Love. And you say, well, I can't even tolerate. How can I love? He says, it's okay. You're not going alone. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the lessons again from Moses. Thank you that we not only read a story and find it entertaining or interesting or thought-provoking, but we can take these lessons and we realize that uh, you still work with people in the same way. And I pray that we would learn the lessons of Moses, that we would commune with you in a way um, that our worship would drive our commitment to your plan for us. And then that we would see that your presence is what qualifies and enables us to do whatever your calling is on our life. Thank you for never leaving us alone to do this work. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad you're with us this morning. Um, I want to say a, a word especially to those who have been tuning in online or might later. Uh, if you've got any questions, we'd love to hear questions. We love to invite conversation. In fact, what we're going to do immediately after breaking up from the service here is try to turn comments into conversation. So we'll be dividing up into groups throughout uh, the church facility here. We'd like you to be a part of one of those if you can stay, and um, we can get you hooked up if you're not in one already. Obviously, if you have been listening to this online, uh, that's not available to you, but I want you to know you can always contact me at Mike at convergechurchomaha.org. I'd be happy to enter into a conversation with you as well. Let's sing that final song, and uh, hopefully this is leading us to be thinking about Moses and remembering as God worked with Moses, God is also working with us.